Hi, I'm Barry. Uh, we started coming to Living Waters three years ago uh, when we retired to the, to the area. Uh, we really appreciate that uh, Living Waters appreciates good coffee, has a community time, and that when we moved, we moved right at the beginning of the pandemic, and this, the leadership of the church, Reuben in particular, was wonderful at making sure we had a, we were surrounded by people who could care for us and welcome us into the church and take care of us. So now it's my turn to welcome you to Living Waters. Hi folks, good to be with you. We are so thankful for this season in the life of our church, especially as we enter into November. But let's start by talking about some things that were exciting in October. We hosted Trunk or Treat last week. Hundreds of people turned out in both Willoughby and Fort Langley. So many people who are a part of our church and tons of people that weren't a part of our church that have a better sense of who Living Waters is, our heart for generosity and our commitment to both Fort Langley and Willoughby. Thank you if you were involved in that. If you donated candy, if you turned up, if you decorated a trunk, it was a great event. And we're looking forward to sharing some of those pictures with you later in the month. Hey, coming up is Remembrance Day, as we know, and we wanna invite you to our website to take a look at the information we have there about it. We do have a Remembrance Day event along with the other churches of Fort Langley and thousands of other people that turn up on November 11th to remember. That's here in Fort Langley. Find more information on the website and join us there then. Our young adults have a worship night coming up in the middle of the month. The information is at the bottom of the screen. It's also on our website. We'd love to spend unhurried time together in an evening as young adults worshiping together. So please join us for that. And at the very end of the month, Women's Day is coming up. There's tons of information on our website about it, but let me give you a bit of a snapshot of what it's about. The theme is on forgiveness. Women are gonna be sharing their stories. There's a great guest speaker coming to share as well in Joanne Knight, I know a little bit about her. And uh, there's gonna be lots of opportunities to serve as well because Women's Day is connected to our Helping Hands initiative as we looked closer to Christmas. So there'll be a chance to actually do something practical to help the community and maybe bring a sense of reconciliation in our community, which is very much connected to that theme of forgiveness. There's so much going on in the life of the church. Always include, uh, encourage you actually to just turn to our website and figure out what's going on there. There's plenty of ways to reach out to our team. We can answer any question we have for you. And uh, please just know that we're here for you and we're praying for you. Want one more thing to, to just let you know about is that, that this week and next week, we're gonna be covering the same passage and of scripture as we did in the last couple of weeks. So we have a couple of people doing a reading and a prayer for us. We're so thankful for our congregation that's leaning into that. Now, we're gonna talk about Helping Hands. Here's some of our team to talk about our Helping Hands initiative coming up this Christmas. Hi friends, Dave, Deanna, and Ruben. Guess what? Christmas is just around the corner. And at Living Waters Church, we celebrate Christmas by offering Helping Hands. What is Helping Hands? This is an opportunity where we as a church come alongside activities that are happening and we donate and we serve and it's absolutely creative and amazing. And once again this year, as it's been the past for a number of years, we believe this year is gonna be absolutely amazing. We're actually today standing on Bray Island in Fort Langley. And this is an opportunity that we've been given to serve a Christmas tea for people that live permanently on the campgrounds here in Fort Langley through the summer, uh, winter months. It's an awesome opportunity. Can't wait to be a part of it. There's all kinds of things for kids and for families. Amazing. I love Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of year. And we have an amazing opportunity. We're going to help children that have had to flee the Ukraine to Turkey. Our global workers, Alexa and Tanya Pankoff, have been working there with the orphans. And so we want to be able to decorate and send some amazing Christmas cards to wish them a very Merry Christmas and let them know how much we love them. So parents, families, kids, join in. Christmas is about generosity and Helping Hands is one of the ways that we can be generous at Christmas. Last year we had the opportunity to create a drive-in movie and a food drive in Fort Langley. Uh, and it was a great time together and a great way for us to be generous to our community. Uh, and this year we're excited to say that we're gonna be doing that event again, but instead it's gonna be in the Willoughby neighborhood at Yorkson Creek Middle School. Uh, it's very exciting because now we can offer even more space for more cars to come, uh, for the community to gather and celebrate Christmas, uh, to watch a Charlie Brown Christmas 
and to hear the Christmas story. And so we're excited to be able to do that, to collect for the Langley Food Bank and uh, to really have an impact on the Willoughby neighborhood. And so that is one way that you can be involved by volunteering for that event. But there are many other ways to be involved with Helping Hands and all you have to do is go to our website at lwchurch.ca and you can see a list of all the opportunities, all the ways that you can serve or donate and get involved and you can sign up right online. So we encourage you to be a part of Helping Hands this year. We wish Merry you Christmas! Merry Christmas! Good morning, I'm Kirk Roosh. My wife, Lori, and I have been attending Living Waters for some time, and we're grateful to be with you today. This morning, I'm reading out of Luke chapter 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will you not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he'll send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Let's pray. Living Lord God, the words that you give, every word, is for our good to bless us, to bring us to you, to make us whole. These words scare us. These words make us uncomfortable. We ask you to give us ears to hear so that we hear these words for blessing and grace and wholeness and completeness in you. We thank you for this community that shares in the word together. We thank you, Lord, for all of us from different ages and different places in life. Some of us who are rejoicing and active and busy. Some of us who are suffering and lonely and afraid and anxious. We thank you for the abundance and the joy, the satisfaction we have in life. And we bring to you, Lord, the fear. We bring to you, Lord, the anxiety. We bring to you the uncertainty that lives among us too. Some of us, Lord Jesus Christ, uh, are fearful because we don't know what the future holds for people that we love. And we bring them before you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, for peace and provision and grace for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We ask you to bless the foreign workers that this church supports, Lord. Those who have left father and mother and home and comfort to be with others, to share good news and to bring the ministry and light and healing of Jesus to other places. We call on you, Lord Jesus, even as we worship you and sing praises to you, to fill us with your spirit, that everything you say and do might have full impact on us. In every way, Lord Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves to you, confident that in every way it's in your heart to do good and bless. So we pray now in Jesus' name that you will receive us and enable us to receive you. Amen.
Hi friends, my name is Dave. I'm on the pastoral team here and happy to be sharing from the Gospel of Luke today. I do want to say though, if we've not met, I'd love to meet you. Uh, you found your way to Church Connect. Uh, information for myself and our entire team is on our website. Uh, love, love for you to reach out. Love, love for the chance to uh, um, meet you and hear a bit of your story. Well, Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 35. In this particular passage, we are seeing a bit of transition. We're seeing Jesus transition from more intimate dinner parties to seeing him followed by large crowds. And we are catching up to a passage of scripture that he addresses large crowds. And to the large crowds, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Verse 26. This passage is not about hating people. This passage is about loving someone. And to be specific, it's about loving Jesus more than anyone else. I grew up attending church. My dad was a pastor. And from day one, Dave was at church. And what a beautiful Christian heritage I have. I am so thankful for that and do not take any of that for granted. I can't remember because of that a time of not knowing about Jesus. But I realize that is not the case in everyone's situation. When uh, our two daughters were born at the Montreal Jewish General, on one, on one of those occasions, uh, Julie's roommate had never heard of the name of Jesus. I'm serious. In talking with her over those three or four days we were together, she had never heard that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. She had never heard that Jesus Christ lived on earth, died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, and raised again on the third day, ascended to heaven, and is a soon coming king. She'd never heard any of that. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in that large crowd in Luke chapter 14, or even today to be a person on earth that does not know anything about Jesus? Can you imagine how different you would approach sickness? How different you would approach sin? your personal finances, provision, retirement, your future, life after death, your relationship with your loved ones, relationship with people that you really don't like, how joy and happiness would be referenced differently. Can you imagine, as a Christian, perhaps, what your life would be absent of if there was no Bible, there was no prayer, there was no worship, and there was no possibility of an eternal reward. Can you imagine life without Psalm 23 or the Lord's Prayer? These are the types of people that were following Jesus in Luke chapter 14. And these are the type of people that live around us in the Fraser Valley. And so Jesus in Luke 14 was inviting people into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is big because the invitation of the kingdom is very big. And the invitation still today is needed in the world today. What does this mean? This passage. This passage, as I said, is not so much about what we are not supposed to do. It's more about what Jesus has done for us. And I, and I want to um, explain that a little bit today. We see three things from this passage. And that's certainly those first few verses in this longer passage. Number one, that Jesus invites individuals into an exclusive relationship. No love in our life is to eclipse our love from Jesus or for Jesus. And that, of course, is the singular and exclusive offer of salvation for all people. It's an undeserved gift. 
The gift of knowing that you're loved, the gift of knowing that you're invited, that you're included, and that you and I are sought after by God. It's exclusive. Jesus knows your name, and Jesus knows your need, and he exclusively makes an offer to you. Number two, he offers the gift of being freed up to love only one person more than everyone else. That's freedom. I've noticed from my own life and from my observation of others that the most unhappy people on earth or some of the most unhappy people on earth are Christians who are double-minded, trying to be, to live a double standard. Those described in Revelation 3.16, perhaps that are neither hot nor cold. The Christian that's unsure in relationships is hesitant, uncommitted, trying to be many things to a lot of people rather than being all things for one person, and that's Jesus. Again, these verses are not about hating people. They are about loving Jesus more deeply. So in this passage, in that verse, Jesus uses perhaps what may symbolize our most deepest human connection, family, as an illustration, and says following him involves making room more room for him than any other, including family. So Jesus didn't come to break up relationships. No, Jesus makes it clear. If we get a relationship right with him, all other relationships will be more fully nourished and established. Way back in the day, uh, when Julie and I were involved in premarital counseling, way back in the day, um, we learned a few things. At least I did. <laughs> she did. We did. And, and I specifically remember the challenge from our pastor to, and, and it was worded this way, the greatest gift we could be to each other was to prioritize our relationship with Jesus and grow up individually into all that God has in his mind for each of us. In other words, the challenge was make the most room for God and you will be able to love and serve each other from an overflow of that love. And that's good advice still today. We're still working on it. And over the years, perhaps, that has found a way to unite us. You've heard the simple illustration of a triangle. Dave is here, and Julie is here, and God is here. And Dave's pursuing God, and Julie is pursuing God. And so most naturally, we are being drawn together because of the individual singular love we have for the one that matters most, and that's Jesus. That's what Jesus was referring to in this passage of Scripture. Thirdly, we find in Jesus all we need for love and good deeds. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. I wrote this. You ever write a, a note to yourself, <laughs> not just to keep track of daily duties, but perhaps um, something that goes into matters that are a bit more um, important. I wrote this recently in response to this passage that we're in today. I wrote it this way. I said, Dave, don't narrowly read self-help books and how to be a better husband, father, friend, pastor, leader. Rather, prioritize learning in this way, by growing in your attraction to God, by dying to self, and learn to live as a dearly loved child of God. For it is this transformation that will bless those around you. It is this transformation and new way of living that will teach you how to love, sacrifice, serve, care, provide for those around you and help you fulfill your duties and responsibilities. Why? 
because you are being transformed by a God that loves you and you are becoming something that you can't make yourself. You can only become because of what God is doing in your life. See, we find in Jesus all we need for love and good deeds. So often our we live our life fragmented and compartmentalized. Compartmentalized. We have a work life, we have a school life, a family and home life, we have a recreational life, we have political and social views and responsibilities, we have church life. And Jesus' invitation here and expectation here is in order to help us work this out is, is this, we, these do not have to be competitors, but there can only be one hub. There can only be one center that drives the hub and movement of our lives. There can only be one big priority that informs and shapes the whole of who we are and what we do, and that center must be Jesus. We have to guard the center and think about the implications. What are the implications? That means that everything we say, do, choose, and care arises from a consistent source, which therefore reveals Jesus' love and the life we have found in him. Number two, it means that we are to be the same person with the same values, principles, and beliefs, regardless of where we are, who we're with, or what we are doing. So how does that get played out? In our text, we see it. Verse 27, And whoever then does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The King James Version says, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, this is a further call to action. This is a call to know how to live as a responsible follower of Jesus in that exclusive singular relationship that Jesus calls us into. So just as the crowds came in Luke chapter 14 from far and wide, so still do people come to Jesus. We come from far and wide carrying our crosses to Jesus. I love Living Waters Church. I love being on our team. I love our community. I love the people that make up this awesome community of Living Waters Church. I feel so blessed day in and day out. Multiple reasons why. One of the reasons includes our Newcomers Life Group. We are just finishing this fall season of our Newcomers Life Group. There's been 21 of, one of us on a six-week journey together. What I like is a couple things. I like growing in my love and appreciation for awesome people that are finding their way at Living Waters Church. And secondly, I grow in my love and appreciation for how Jesus take care, takes care of people over long periods of time. Our Newcomers Life Groups gives opportunity uh, to hear stories, and you hear it over and over again. I hear it from my own story, and I hear it from Julie's story, and I heard it again this fall from the people that are in the room telling their story. What am I getting at? We all come from far and wide carrying our crosses that have been accumulated and defined because of our past. So these crosses that we bring along with us have come from our stories from our first families from situations and circumstances that come our way, from choices we make, from priorities that we have had over the course of our time. And, and, and of course, everybody's story is so different, but we do carry a cross to the same, we carry our own cross to the same Jesus. This cross that we carry before coming to Christ is a cross that perhaps could be defined by a burden by um, perhaps pain and suffering, disappointment. Sometimes it's addiction. Sometimes it's vulnerability and trouble and mental health issues. But we carry these crosses because we all have a past. And in this verse, Jesus says, the pathway to discipleship, and again, we all come from such different places, but we all have to make our way to the same Jesus. So we carry our cross to Jesus. And oh, the miracle of salvation 
that is offered to people that come with their cross to Jesus. Again, their cross, my cross, and my story that I told at our newcomers group, the cross that I carry represents all my stuff. And Jesus gives us something much better than the cross that we bring to him. So what happens when we bring our cross to Jesus? Well, number one, we no longer have to die on that cross. Wow. Again, I don't want to tell the stories of newcomers. I won't do that. But boy, in the context of newcomers life group, and it would be the case in multiple places around, but people have been on a path of destruction and are carrying a cross that would actually kill them. But all oh, the hope of the gospel that I found, and perhaps uh, you have found, and perhaps if you've not found, you can find today. So what happens when we bring our cross to Jesus? Well, in exchange for our old cross, Matthew 11 says, now then take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart and you will find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Corinthians 5 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is the new creation has come, the old has gone and the new is here. That's what Christian living is. Coming to Jesus, taking the old cross, taking the old way of living and having Jesus take it and deliver us from it and giving us a new yoke to carry and giving us things that are all new in him. Wow. It's from this new creation going forward that Jesus' word is to be applied. The old is gone, the new has come, and it's upon the new that Jesus builds his um, word and he builds uh, us based upon our response and obedience to all that is new. Jesus offers us this so that his work is meant to be fulfilled. John 3 says it this way, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I think we've all experienced this. We hear the great commandments and the great commission spoken over us. And we try to muster up some goodwill and discipline and some sacrificial determination to do the right thing the right way. Well, if, if that's what our Christianity is, it's tied to works and it's tied to us. And Jesus frees us of that. We may have some short-term success with this, but that will all it will ever become. Colossians says, no, we put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, Ephesians 4, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That is why this passage that we're reading is such good news. Our story speaks about new beginnings. The teaching and application of God's word is to be applied to our new nature, a new heart, a renewed mind, and we learn how to do things by following God's example with the renewed strength he gives us Something we can't find on our own until we come to Jesus. Such good news. Verse 28 to 32 tells, um, Luke tells in his gospel uh, the story or the illustration of, of, of two, two, two types of people. There's, a, there's the, the man trying to build a tower. And secondly, there's a king preparing to um, set out to war to enlarge his rule. Verses 28 to 32. Um, perhaps these two illustrations answer the questions that people have when they come to Jesus. Number one, can, in verses 28 to 30, the first question perhaps is, can Jesus finish the work he started? And in verse 31 to 32, can Jesus fulfill his promise to truly be a, a, a ruler within my life. So let's answer that based upon the text. Number Question number one, can Jesus finish the work he started? Yes, Jesus can. And Jesus describes this master builder who has thought through the completion of the work and so makes an invitation based upon the fact that he can complete the work that he started. Matthew 16, 18, and I tell you, Jesus said to Peter on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus, when he invites us 
into this new work. Yes, he is a master builder and he's thought it through. And he says, yes, I I will complete the work that I start with in your life. You just need to keep coming to me. Builders that are responsible don't start jobs they can't finish. And nor does Jesus. The work that he has started in you, he will complete. To the point where Ephesians 2 will come to pass, where we become God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 3 says, he will equip you with every good deed for doing his will. So God is a master builder, and he answers that within our text. Secondly, the second question, could God fulfill his promise to be a a, a conquering king? And so the illustration of the king here in in this this, uh, chapter, the, the king considers the battle that's in front, and does the king have potential to complete the rule for occupation? And the answer to that question is yes. Jesus is a conquering king, and he invites us into his rule and into his reign. So a king is about territory and about occupation and rule. And this is what Jesus has for us. He seeks to occupy territory. And in this passage of scripture, us as individuals are that territory. 1 Corinthians 16, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God, you are not your own. So the king seeks to occupy territory and he does that through his occupation of us as we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The territory of our physical bodies now is a territory given to the rule of the king, Jesus. And secondly, A king is about territory and it's about rule. Colossians 3 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body, you are called to peace. So we are to be thankful. So Jesus says, yeah, I'm the master builder. Yeah, I'm the conquering king and I've come to uh, work within your life. I invite you into my kingdom of which there is one king and that's me. So our hearts become the platform that we give our attention to so that God can rule and be glorified through. Luke 14, two more passages, verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. So here is this master builder. Here is this conquering king. And we, as his people, we give up everything we have to him. This is key. When we're figuring out our lives and our talents and our treasures and our time, we give up everything to God. We don't give it away. We don't give our lives away. We give it up to God. Notice the wording. That we give up everything we have to God. That is an act of worship. When we give our time, we give our talents, we give our treasures, we give it up to God. We don't give it away. We give it up to God. And by so doing, We are worshipers, and he begins to do the work with the things we offer up to him. We don't walk away from our stuff. We hold it up to God as an offering of worship. We honor the giver of the gift, not the gift. And finally, in verse 34, salt is good, but if it loses saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Just as salt is the unique, because of its taste and ability to preserve, so are disciples. Unique and necessary in this world today. In what way? Well, disciples and followers of Jesus, just as salt is unique, disciples are unique because of our confession and our witness. And if a disciple loses their confession and their witness, they lose their usefulness. So here, what is important is for us to be very clear on what our mouthpiece is, what our confession is, is in that we are followers of Jesus. He's invited us into the kingdom and he's done such good things for us. We want everybody to know. That witness in the world preserves the reputation. That, um, that witness in the world today 
acts like salt because it preserves the integrity of our community, knowing that there is a Savior and that Savior is still inviting more and more people into this big, big kingdom of which he's a master builder and a conquering king. So today, Luke chapter 14, we find ourselves, we see ourselves as part of the crowd perhaps. And Jesus today would be looking across the crowd, be looking at you today and saying, I'm inviting you into my kingdom. And for those perhaps like myself, I've said yes to Jesus. I'm gonna keep saying yes because Jesus is doing things in me that I can't do for myself. He continues to relieve me of my cross and give me something that I actually can bear for long term. Leads me on a path that will lead me to a responsible life on earth and all the anticipation of the eternal reward with Jesus forever. And that invitation is for you as well today. Thank you so much for joining us today. How good to be able to look at who Jesus is and what he calls us to, which is really just an invitation to the full life that he has for us. Uh, May you have a great week. I hope that you have so many chances to be with Jesus and to hear his invitation to go further up and further into life with him. Have a great week.